Welcome everyone. Sorry it's been uh, quite a while since uh, the last video I've posted, uh, but uh, I'm hoping to put, put two up today on prairie and grassland, a little bit of background, and then some more uh, about uh, the restoration of them. So I hope you're able to get uh, online and check out our, our Moodle forums, both on the article discussions, um, and go on there and, and comment. Uh, and I would recommend checking those out about once a week. Go online, see what's been posted, and, and respond to that. So I hope you all are doing well, and we're getting down toward the end of the semester here, so hang in there. So prairies and grasslands, a little different ecosystem from where we live here. We'll see why that is in just a moment, but uh, historically very important areas. Right, These are places that have been uh, put under the plow for a lot of agricultural uh, work and of course historically we're home to a lot of biodiversity and these ecosystems occur all over the planet on every continent uh, from the Cerrado of South America to the savanna of Africa to the steppes of Asia prairies and grasslands are ubiquitous around the world so we're going to talk about all these questions here but begin with thinking about what actually makes the grassland. It's not as straightforward as you might think. So it is an area dominated by grass species uh, and uh, other di different kinds of non-woody non plants. Uh, some, some graminoids in particular can be important contributors here. Uh, but depending on where you are, trees can be important as well. Areas where there's a little higher rainfall, uh, some low-lying areas, and then uh, in the African savanna as well. So they occur naturally in lots of places around the world. Uh, but as we'll see in just a moment, these ecosystems are, are driven largely by uh, disturbance regime. And in particular, uh, grazing plays a large part of that. So there are areas of the world where uh, livestock grazing maintains uh, ecosystems in a grassland condition that would normally uh, move toward more of a woody vegetation dominated uh, um, uh, biome uh, if succession was allowed to um, to progress along its natural trajectory. So if we look at the original distribution of the prairie and, and grassland ecosystems uh, in the US, uh, so you know, the, the, these are massive. Grasslands were the, the largest vegetation formation in North America on the Great Plains. But, but of the area that was naturally grassland, less than 1% remains intact. So uh, again, uh, we talked about how much wetlands have been destroyed. Uh, grasslands as well uh, have been turned into all other different kinds of ecosystems uh, that uh, we find more amenable to human colonization. Uh, but there's this interesting pattern where as you move from east to west, uh, you first encounter the tall grass prairie then going further west, a mixed grass prairie, and finally, uh, a short grass prairie. So there's this gradation from west to, from east to west uh, of uh, the tall grass prairie. And when I say tall grass, I mean species like big blue stem that are over two meters tall, um, eventually progressing to, to a short grass ecosystem as you start to get toward the edge of deserts in the west. So when we think about the spatial pattern of grasslands and what causes it, you might have some ideas from looking at this map, uh, but here's what's going on. It's really all driven by precipitation. If we look at these bands of precipitation across the U.S. again, we see this general decline, a consistent decline uh, from east moving west, uh, in particular from the southeast uh, moving towards the west. Uh, so those bands of um, of grassland biomes in the in the the American Midwest here correspond to a transition from forested biomes to desert biomes, and so you can see there are some sections of desert out there in in the West that get less than five inches of rain a year. Of course, when you move far enough to the West, you get on the other side of the Cascades and and get a lot of rain. Uh, but so there's this transition from the short grass to mixed, uh, I'm sorry, from the tall grass to the mixed to the short grass prairie, 
where we're going from somewhere on the order of 30 to 35 inches of rain a year uh, all the way down to, to 15 or 20. So by the time you get into the short grass prairie, you're getting almost half as much rain as a tall grass prairie does. And that what that does is that that uh, that determines how much energy plants can invest into growth as opposed to uh, simply maintaining uh, their root biomass. What's interesting to me, if you look at Western North Carolina as well, you see we're in a pocket of uh, of extremely high precipitation, uh, and it's it's interesting. Um, you know, we have some areas there, 70 to 100 uh, inches of rain per year. That's those are the headwaters of the the French Broad River there, so a lot of rain. Interestingly enough, um, last year we received over twice the average rainfall in Asheville, so we were up over 140 inches. Um, so uh, even more rain fall, falling than normal, but these high uh, precipitation levels are really a boon for aquatic organisms in our, our neck of the woods. So these precipitations are really driving the spatial pattern of these grasslands. So not surprisingly then, you find that water limits plant growth to a great extent in these ecosystems. This is an aerial photo of the Flint Hills in Kansas, kind of out near where I did my, my master's degree. And what you can see is in these low-lying areas where the soil surface is closer to the, to the water table, um, you have trees that are able to grow, whereas up in the higher elevations you don't. So you see these patterns of trees kind of extending through the stream and the watershed these river valleys. So you look at the way that these plants are able to grow, it's it's pretty dramatic. Um, you know, these are areas of low rainfall. These are plants that are living at the edge of uh, their tolerance for rainfall. So not surprisingly, they invest a lot of energy uh, in roots to be able to ensure that uh, they can uh, get down deep enough uh, to always have access to water. And so uh, this picture on the left is... Uh, the soil where uh, you can just see how much more biomass is below ground than above ground in these grasslands. And then picture on the right just shows root systems. Uh, this is a, a wheat plant that's been uh, developed, uh, you know, wheat normally an annual crop. Uh, but they've also developed perennial wheat plants, which, which are awesome because they live year-round and their soil, the soil is held together by their roots. Uh, all year round. You just look at the volume of the root mass in the perennial plant versus annual. So um, uh, these these grass roots are really, really important to these ecosystems. So when I was out in, uh, in uh, Texas teaching at Austin College, there was a prairie restoration project there. And as part of that, uh, they had... Um, this schematic, this card, which I found was really cool, and it basically just shows how deep the root systems of these these grasses were compared to the height uh, of a person. So, uh, you know, big blue stem has has roots getting down eight to nine feet. Uh, the compass plant goes even further. Now you compare that to these annual plants on the far left, and so of course what you see is that uh, you know these these perennial native grasses are able to persist when the water table drops quite a bit because of this extensive root system. And again, all of these uh, all of these roots help to hold um, the, the soil together. So um, this, this is what the natural grassland condition was like. Lots of below ground root biomass. So there's actually some patches of big blue stem grass in North Carolina. It's really interesting. Um, they're in these dry, sort of south-facing hill slope ecosystems. Uh, this is a picture that I took with um, uh, our environmental restoration class last spring. And um, uh, this out um, on the, uh, the west side of, of the French Broad River, um, Sandy Mush game lands kind of out in that area if you know where that is. And it's very interesting. So this is uh, short leaf pine uh, intermixed with uh, with these grasses. So we do we do have some of these grassland species grass species out here. So it's kind of interesting in some pockets around North Carolina. So thinking about the major factors that naturally structure grasslands, 
The first is high fertility, and the reason for that high fertility is because of the massive amount of below ground root biomass. And so that root biomass, um, you know, these plants have a very high root to shoot ratio. So because of all this biomass, uh, it leads to very high organic content, both in the exudate from the roots, chemicals released by the roots into the soil. And the fact is that some of these, a lot of these areas are low in precipitation, so you don't have very high uh, leaching of nutrients because of rainfall. So these are very, very fertile areas. And of course, this is part of the reason that um, those areas that I showed you earlier have become uh, agricultural now for the most part. So that's one factor that, that's important uh, to making these ecosystems work. Now the second is fire, and I mentioned how important disturbance is to these ecosystems, and, and fire is uh, a very common occurrence out in these grasslands. Again, these are areas that don't get a lot of rainfall, so they can get very dry. And if you've ever lived out in the Midwest, uh, you know what the storms are like out there. You get these intense lightning storms, and so lightning strikes naturally would um, would lead uh, would lead to, to fire in these ecosystems. So if you think about how fire affects grasslands, think for a little bit about how uh, an ecosystem is going to be different after experiencing a fire like this, like this picture here. The first, of course, is that like any disturbance, it's going to reset succession. It's going to make it uh, hard for those early success for those late successional species to do well. In particular, woody plants, right? Because woody plants don't generally do well uh, in fire, with uh, with certain exceptions. But um, you know, these grasses are, are are just fine because their their root system will remain intact. They'll be able to come back. So it resets the successional time scale, first of all. So these, again, are, are, are somewhat early successional ecosystems. And it eliminates fire intolerant species, in particular uh, non natives. So this has really kept uh, a lot of invasives and non natives from getting established. Uh, but again, as we've talked about with other ecosystems, once the natural disturbance regime is suppressed, then that makes it possible for non-native species to, to get in here, and, that, and that, that, that's a problem. Then the final piece is the connection to grazers, and uh, there are large herbivores in these grasslands all over the world, and uh, what these f fires do is uh, replenish nutrients in that top uh, layer of the soil, and so this allows the those uh, those 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 young uh, grass shoots to come back, and those are the most uh, most edible to grazers. So uh, this fire uh, is very attractive. These burned areas are very attractive to bring in grazer species. Then there's one more piece that uh, that structures these grasslands, and so I've just mentioned them. So uh, these are the grazers, right? So um, we'll talk a little bit in the next lecture about how uh, manipulating grazers is an opportunity to restore grasslands because bison on the left uh, feed differently than cattle on the right. And it's very interesting. So the cattle that we raise for the most part in, um, in North America and really around the world uh, are evolved from uh, a wild uh, species of 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 bovine of, of cow that's 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 gone extinct, um, but uh, they of course have been been bred in captivity for so long now that they're they've selected for traits which um, are very specific to their use as agricultural species. Um, so they feed in a very different way from from bison, and so um, grasslands look very different when they've been grazed by bison versus cattle. So uh, so this is another important factor to remember. Okay, so that's a bit of an overview, a little bit of background on grassland ecosystems, and uh, our next uh, our next lecture is going to talk about uh, the disturbances to these in a little more detail and the practices of restoration. Hope you all are doing well.